This video was sponsored by Brilliant. When you run a program on the terminal and press Ctrl C, you expect the program to immediately terminate. But take a look at this. Today we are going to cover an interesting topic, signals. Yet another way processes can communicate without sharing memory. Hi friends, my name is George, and this is Core Dumped. Imagine you're at a traffic light, right behind another car. But when the light finally turns green, the car in front doesn't move. In this situation, you don't send an email to the other driver telling them the light is green, nor do you get out of your car and walk over to tell them to move. Instead, you use the car horn. The sound of the horn doesn't contain any words, yet it serves as a signal, notifying the other driver that something has happened. They will react to the horn by checking the light, and then proceed. We've previously discussed how processes can communicate with each other in two ways. By telling the operating system to allocate a shared memory region, so both processes can read and write to that region. Or by sending messages to each other, in this case, the operating system also needs to provide support for this message passing interface. But there's actually a third option, one that is almost never described as a form of inter-process communication. Sometimes, processes don't need to send, receive, or even share large amounts of data in order to communicate. Sometimes, all a process needs to do is emit a cue, a notification, a signal, to inform another process that something has occurred so that the other process can trigger an action as soon as the signal is detected. This is the premise behind signals. A signal is a small message that notifies a process that some event has occurred in the system. These are the main Linux signals with the events they are meant to communicate. Since there are multiple kind of events that can occur in a system, the operating system defines its own set of different signals that processes and the kernel itself can send to other processes. All signals serve the same purpose of notifying a process of an event, but each one carries a different meaning, indicating a different kind of event. If we are working with C on Linux, signals can be sent using the kill function. This function takes two parameters. SIG is the number representing the specific signal we want to send. And PID is the ID of the process that will receive the signal. That being said, let's write two programs. Program A is a simple program that does two things. It first prints its own process ID. Then it immediately enters an infinite loop, printing a message. Program B, on the other hand, receives a number as an argument, then sends a signal to the process with that process ID, and then it ends after printing a message. Note that the signal that program B is sending to program A is called SIGUSR1. This is just one of two generic signals that can be assigned any purpose by the programmer. If I compile and run program A, you'll see it prints its own process ID and then continuously modifies the text on the screen in its infinite loop, as expected. Now, on another terminal, I'm going to compile program B, and then I'm going to run it, passing as an argument the ID I got from program A. As soon as I run program B, Program A terminates its execution. But why? It was executing an infinite loop, so it shouldn't have terminated. Well, there is one important thing we need to understand about signals. A signal allows processes and the kernel to interrupt other processes. That's why it didn't matter that Program A was running an infinite loop. It still got interrupted. Interrupting a process, however, is not the same as terminating it. So this still doesn't explain why program A terminated when it received the signal from program B. The answer is actually pretty simple. Each signal has a default handler in the receiving process. For SIGUSR1, the default handler is to terminate the process. Since we didn't tell program A how to handle that signal, it fell back to its default behavior, terminating itself. If we don't want our program to terminate when this signal is received, we need to write our own handler. Enter the signal function. Just as the kill function is used to send a signal, the signal function is used to define how our program should react when it receives a signal. It takes two parameters, signum, the specific signal we want to handle, and handler of a special type called a signal handler, which is simply a pointer to another function. If you're not familiar with C, think of it like higher level languages, like TypeScript, where you can pass a function as an argument to another function. 
The handler is simply another function where we define what our program should do when it receives the signal. So, to prevent program A from terminating when it receives SIGUSR1, we can define our own handler. In this example, I've written a handler that simply prints a message when the signal is received, and then I pass that handler to the signal function. Under the hood, calling signal makes our process invoke a system call that tells the operating system, whenever this specific signal is received, immediately pause whatever I'm doing and execute this handler function instead. The formal term for this action is installing a handler for the signal. And now, if I run both programs again, you'll see that instead of terminating, program A prints the message we defined. I can even run program B multiple times, and every time it sends the signal, program A executes the handler instead of terminating, as expected. Notice that once the signal has been handled, the program goes back to whatever it was doing. But how is any of these related to control C? Well, explaining this can be a little tricky, but here we keep things intuitive. Kind of like how Brilliant makes learning simple and visual. As developers, one of our main goals should be to improve our problem-solving abilities. With Brilliant, you gain access to dozens of interactive courses designed by experts, enabling you to learn by doing rather than just reading. Their first principles approach helps you build a deep understanding from the ground up. Each lesson is packed with hands-on problem-solving activities that allow you to engage with concepts, a method proven to be six times more effective than simply watching lecture videos. Brilliant is also available on your phone, making it easy to build real knowledge in just a few minutes a day, unlike mindlessly scrolling through PDFs. Their latest courses, including Applied Python, Creative Coding, and Thinking in Code, are perfect for building foundational skills and learning real-world applications, helping you to develop the mindset to think like a programmer and begin creating complex programs to build games and apps. To learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash core dumped scan the QR code on screen, or click on the link in the description. Brilliant's also given our viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant. And now, back to the video. What you are looking at right now is what most people called a terminal. Terminals are strange because the actual program that interpret your commands is called a shell. The terminal is just the window displaying the shell's output. The shell sits on top of the kernel and acts as an interface between you and the operating system. It's called a shell because it's the only way for you to interact with the operating system's kernel, so it's like it completely surrounds it. A command line interface is a shell that interacts with the user exclusively through text. When you press a key, the shell registers that keystroke, adds the character to a buffer, and updates what you see on screen. But here's the thing. Not all keystrokes create visible characters. If we check the ASCII table, the first 32 entries are non-printable control codes. Back in the early days when computers had no monitors, these were used to control devices like teletypes or printers. Things like carriage returns, line feeds, or tabs were achieved using these special characters. This is actually a topic that deserves its own video, so let me know in the comments if you want me to talk about that in the future. These control characters still exist today, and even though we no longer use them to control printers, they're still used for things like formatting text on the screen, and we can even use them in other ways. We usually can't input all of them with a single key though, so instead we use combinations like control plus another key. In fact, that one key on your keyboard is called control because it was originally used to send control characters to terminals to perform actions like moving the cursor or clearing the screen. And here is the important part. Since these control characters can't be displayed, the shell repurposes them so the user can trigger specific actions instead. Now let's connect this back to signals. In the Linux signal table, you'll see a signal called SIGINT, short for Signal Interrupt. Its description? Interrupt from keyboard. Sometimes it's useful for the user to send a signal to a process without having to write or run an entirely separate program to do it. It turns out that some of those special control characters tell the operating system's kernel that you want to emit a signal. When we run a program on the terminal, we are actually dealing with two different processes, the shell and our running program. The reason processes terminate with control C when running in a terminal is that the terminal driver, part of the kernel, interprets control C as a request to send the SIGINT interrupt signal to the foreground process group. The SIGINT signal only interrupts them though. 
and the reason most programs terminate is because their default behavior for SIGINT is to terminate. So just like before, we can override this behavior by writing our own signal handler for SIGINT. But this time, instead of just printing a message, let's do something fun. Play this cat sound whenever program A receives the SIGINT signal. Okay, so now, every time I press Control c instead of terminating, my program should play a cat sound. I wanted to talk about this part in the video, but I just couldn't stop laughing. So, another day, maybe. If you want to try it yourself, I've uploaded the code to GitHub. Now, I could end the video here. But let's take a quick look at a few more important things you need to know when working with signals. Not all processes run in the foreground. In fact, most of the processes on your system are running in the background. Just open your task manager, and you'll see hundreds of processes running without any terminal or window associated with them. Let's say you spot one of those background processes. Maybe it's a server you started a month ago. But now it's acting up. It's leaking memory and slowly eating all your RAM. So you decide to terminate it no matter what. For convenience, let's call it the bad process. Since it is not running in the foreground of a terminal, pressing Control c isn't an option. So what do we do? Well, we could open a terminal and run that little program we wrote earlier, Program B, passing it the process ID of the bad process. If nothing happens and the program doesn't terminate, now we are suspicious. Maybe the bad process has installed a custom handler for SIGUSR1, the specific signal we're sending through program B. So we write a third program, program C. This one's more flexible. It lets us specify any signal we want to send, along with the target process ID, both as command line arguments. This way, we can compile it and start sending different signals to the bad process until we find one that gets the job done. But this doesn't sound like a clever solution, right? If you've been paying attention, you might already see why this is a terrible idea. First, we're just hoping the bad process hasn't installed handlers for all the signals that normally cause it to terminate. And second, even if we eventually send the right signal, all the other signals we sent before might have triggered unintended behavior, especially if the program wasn't written by us. Who knows what kind of internal routines were tied to those signals. But here's the good news. We don't have to play this guessing game, because what we're afraid of isn't even possible. Most systems, including Linux, define certain signals that cannot be intercepted, blocked, or ignored by user-level processes. Specifically, there are two signals that no process can override. SIGKILL, signal number 9, and SIGSTOP, signal number 19. If a process receives SIGKILL, it will be terminated. No handler, no cleanup, no escape. So instead of playing signal roulette with program C, we can always send signal 9, SIGKILL, to the bad process, and because that signal can't be caught or ignored, be confident that the process will be forcefully terminated. As soon as I run program C to send signal 9, you can see that bad process is no longer running, and all the memory it was consuming has been freed. Now at this point, some of you might be wondering, why not just use the kill command to do this in the first place? And yes, you are right, but from a certain point of view, that's exactly what I did. You see, the kill command doesn't exist solely to kill processes. It's actually a Linux utility that let you manually send any signal to any process, just as program C. It's called kill because under the hood, it uses the kill function to send the signal. By the way, the dash is necessary before the signal number because if you don't type it, the kill utility parses that number as another process ID, sending by default signal 15 to those processes. This also explains why sometimes simply typing kill plus the process ID doesn't work, and we have to pass dash 9 to the command to force the process to terminate. Unlike sigterm, sigkill cannot be handled, so when we send that signal, the process will inevitably terminate its execution. Another signal that cannot be caught and always falls back to its default handler is sigstop. I'm not going to go deep into this specific signal, but rather into the group of signals that share the same default behavior. These are signals that, by default, make a process stop running, but without actually terminating it. When a process is stopped this way, it's essentially frozen until another signal tells it to continue, usually sigcont, short for signal continue. 
On Linux, if you run a program in a terminal and press Ctrl Z, you're telling the kernel to send SIG TSTP, short for terminal stop, to the process running in that terminal. Unfortunately, there's no direct keyboard shortcut for SIGCONT. If we want the process to resume, we need to send the signal manually. For example, sending signal 18 with the kill utility, and then telling the terminal to bring the process to the foreground so we can keep seeing its output. Another thing to know, signals can be sent to more than one process at once. Just like processes have unique IDs, they can also belong to process groups, each with its own group ID. If you call the kill function but pass a negative process ID, the signal will be sent to all processes in the group whose ID matches the absolute value you passed. Before wrapping up, I want you to notice something. Most events that trigger interrupts are actually system-level events. If a process tries to divide by zero, the CPU's internal circuitry detects it and raises a hardware interrupt. The kernel's reaction? Send a SIG FPE signal, short for floating point exception, to that process. If a process tries to execute an illegal instruction, like a privileged CPU instruction in user mode, the CPU catches it, and the kernel sends SIG ill. If a process tries to access memory it doesn't own, special CPU hardware detects it. The kernel sends a SIG SEG V signal, or segmentation violation. Since the default handler for SIG SEG V is to terminate the process and dump core, the program will exit and you'll see the familiar message, segmentation fault, core dumped. We often think that when necessary, the operating system simply terminates programs on its own. But in reality, it sends signals instructing the processes to terminate themselves. Now, some of you might be thinking, wait, SIGSEGV can be caught, right? So we could install a custom handler to stop our program from being terminated by segmentation faults? Technically, yes. You can install a handler for SIGSEGV, but there's a good reason it's a bad idea. In fact, here's a great answer I found in this ghost town called Stack Overflow explaining why this can cause even more problems than it solves. Anyway, the reason signals aren't usually taught as a form of inter-process communication is because the message they carry isn't general-purpose data. It's a system-level or user-level event meant to interrupt the process and force it to react in a certain way. That's why they're more often categorized under exceptional control flow. Finally, Keep in mind that in practice, signals can be tricky to work with, and you should always be cautious when handling them. To put it in perspective, bad signal handling can go so wrong that it can cause race conditions, even if you're not working with threads. So if you're planning to work on a project involving signals, I strongly recommend doing a deeper dive into the topic. Personally, I recommend Chapter 8, Section 5 of Computer Systems, A Programmer's Perspective, by Randall E. Bryant, it has way more detail than I could fit into a single video. And that's it for now. If you want to learn more low-level concepts without falling asleep, hit that subscribe button. And if you enjoyed this video or learned something new, please leave a like. It's free and helps others discover my content. See you in the next one.